I'm trained as a geneticist, I did human genetics research at the NIH as a postdoc, came to FDA um, to start looking at regulation of genetic tests and um, have been there for about eight years total now with a small detour for two years into industry where I work for Affymetrics. I was the director of regulatory affairs. Um, and that was uh, about the time that the Affymetrics and Roche collaboration that produced the Amplichip. I think one of the biggest barriers right now is the ability of pharma and diagnostic companies to find a way to work together uh, in ways that reduces the risk for both sides. And diagnostic companies tend to have a lot less money to spend and are a lot uh, more risk averse than pharmaceutical companies. I think that's really going to be one of the biggest things to overcome. Most treatments, including drugs, biologics, things like vaccines and so on, are regulated by either the Center for Drugs or the Center for Biologics. Most diagnostic devices um, that would be used to direct treatments are regulated by the Center for Devices or the Center for Biologics. So there's a lot of various pieces of the puzzle that can fit together in different ways. And what we're trying to do now through um, internal processes is to build internal SOPs that say when we have a product that would be regulated by two centers, that we have um, coordinated ways of dealing with each other to get scientifically valid reviews as well as reviews that are timely. We have timelines we need to stick to and we don't want to um, discourage people by taking too long. The way we're seeing it now is that it will require two decisions to be made, one for the treatment, therapeutic, and one for the diagnostic. However, the treatment is generally the primary mode of action in this, and so if the diagnostic's not available, then there's a possibility in some situations that the treatment won't be approved because it's dependent on the diagnostic. Yeah. So there, there will be two approvals, but one of them may be blocked by the lack of the other. There have not been a lot of examples that have made it through, and most of them, in fact, are rather old now, Herceptin and HER2 testing being, you know, sort of the, the one that's most well known. And so, uh, but we are seeing in early stages through IND processes, pre-IDEs for, for devices, that there's a lot of interest. So I'm expecting in a few years we'll see a lot of things sort of ready to, to get approval. The checklist on day one is decide whether you think you're going to have to have a test or not and get that in your mind early and start pursuing it early and best advice is don't wait until the end if you can possibly avoid it. The second best thing to do is start talking to the FDA as soon as you think you've got this possibility of a, of a, of a co-developed product because we will have specific advice um, about how to do your trials and what the device needs to look like and how validated it needs to be and so on. In the device side we certainly can. We talk to people at the concept stage all the time because every device has different issues and so you really have to kind of start early, especially if it's a novel device. Um, on the drug and biologic side, they do a little bit less of that. They have more yeah. formal procedures, but there are mechanisms um, such as uh, scientific interactions and um, consults with, with our center, the Center for Devices, that, that could help. So there haven't been any actual regulatory changes that I'm aware of. There have been changing interpretations and policies of existing regulations. Um, we are, in fact, now expecting to um, revise our approach towards different types of testing where in the past people could bring a test to market without going t through the FDA process and we're looking at that now. We think there's, there's an issue there and we are working internally on our policies to combine the regulation of a treatment with the, with the diagnostic, but we don't have any actual changes in regulation that help us out there. Diagnostics will probably have a large impact um, on, on health care and on comparative effectiveness research. A lot of money has been put into that by, by the federal government, and certainly diagnostics that tell you who, need, who will benefit from a treatment, who might suffer an adverse event that would be very expensive to care for, should be a big part of comparative effectiveness. FDA has done a little bit of work in this area, 
but uh, not a lot on the diagnostic side. We're, we're primarily focusing on getting approvals and clearances through so that people can make the comparative effectiveness arguments.